I hit the wrong button. Hi, everybody. I'm Skip Belsheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where we watch old 16mm films, and that was Primitive Mammals. So those weird mammals that lay eggs and other weird things, spiny anteaters and platypuses and kind of, yeah, interesting things. Um, you know, I guess as a kid, that was, you know, you were drawn to stuff like that. Like, you know, these, uh, animal trivia books are like, Ooh, like, um, armadillos have identical twins. They always have identical twins. Um, and they're the only animals that get, uh, leprosy besides humans and, you know, stuff like that. I don't know. Anyways, uh. I love trivia as a kid. This might be why I'm drawn to uh, collecting films. I mean, this might be one of those moments where I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, because I uh, would go to the library and check out a bunch of books of trivia about anything. Just tr interesting facts. Um, and uh, didn't really matter the topic. I don't think I was as interested in sports trivia because I just wasn't interested in sports but there were certainly interesting stories in there that I gleaned but uh that, that might be why I'm a fan of collecting these films because it's this diverse amount of information and I can pull out inf in, in, interesting things from that um so anyways yes brains full of useless info uh poetry there's so many kinds There are different kinds of music. There are different kinds of poetry, too. Poetry began as music. It developed and grew out of early folk ballads. Robin Hood put on his harness good, on his head a cap of steel, broad sword and buckler by his side, and they became him will. And coming on Folk ballads are still sung. Their words are poetry. Home, home on the range. Where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. When most people think of poetry, they think of the stanza form. Each division of the poem has a regular pattern of number of lines, rhythm, and rhyme. The stanza form was used by Alfred Lord Tennyson in this narrative poem that tells the story of the disastrous defeat of the British Light Brigade at Balaclava during the Crimean War of 1854. Theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. There's what to do and die. Into the Valley of Death rode the 600. A characteristic of the narrative poem is that it tells a story through action. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. The language is simple and direct. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. 
all the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the Light Brigade, Noble 600. Narrative poetry, like Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, is usually concerned more with action and story rather than with character and characterization. Extremely long narrative poems that stress the adventurous deeds of legendary heroes are called epic poems. Beowulf is an epic poem about a mythical Anglo-Saxon warrior who fought and slew the dreaded Grendel, a grotesque monster. From the stretching moors, from the misty hollows, Grendel came creeping, accursed of God. A murderous ravenger minded to snare spoils of heroes in high-built halls. In contrast to storytelling narrative poetry is lyric poetry, describing common human experiences with a song-like use of words. Edgar Allan Poe wrote the lyric love poem, Annabelle Lee, in memory of his dead wife, Virginia Clem. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know, by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. Characteristic of lyric poetry is the use of words and phrases to create vivid images. No other thought than to love and be loved by me. A wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my Annabelle Lee. One means of varying the tone and mood of lyric poetry is with symbols, words that are used to represent other things. Robert Frost in The Road Not Taken uses the simplest of words to produce a symbolic effect. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one, one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The choice of the road is a symbol for any choice in life. Choices that lead to different destinations. Lyric poetry deals intimately with common human experiences. Life and nature. Love and death. Lyric poetry, like all good poetry, enables the reader to look at well-known things in a new way. Audiences are often important for dramatic poetry, which is commonly written for the stage. Hamlet's soliloquy is dramatic poetry, in which Hamlet contemplates suicide. I bears the rub, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Robert Browning's My Last Duchess is a dramatic poem not written for the stage. It is a dramatic character study, elegantly developed through monologue. The jealous Duke of Ferrara shows a visitor the portrait of his late wife, whom he may have had murdered. That's my last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Frau Pandolf's hands work busily a day, and there she stands. Browning continues the poem, characterizing the Duchess in detail. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Almost all poetry falls into one of three categories. In dramatic poetry, characters speak, revealing their inner personalities. Usually, elements of suspense or conflict are interwoven. 
In lyric poetry, personal thoughts and deep feelings are expressed in a song-like structure. And in narrative poetry, character is revealed by events and actions. But poetry doesn't have to be serious. Lewis Carroll, author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, wrote pure nonsense in his poem, Jabberwocky. Poems of this type are often called light verse. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome rats outgrabe. Jabberwocky is light verse in stanza form. A highly stylized type of light verse without stanzas is the limerick. There was an old man of Peru who dreamt he was eating his shoe. He awoke in the night in a terrible fright and found it was perfectly true. The limerick has a catchy, forceful rhythm. The first two lines and the last line rhyme with each other. And the third and fourth shorter lines rhyme. Another specialized form of poetry is haiku. Haiku creates a picture image using few words to suggest more than it actually says. Many winds that blow, ask them which leaf of the tree will be next to go. Is the poem really about leaves? Many winds that blow, ask them which leaf of the tree will be next to go. Haiku poetry is restricted to just 17 syllables, usually arranged in a five, seven, five syllable pattern. Haiku poetry by custom about nature also deals with common human experiences on a high level of sensitivity. Another kind of poetry as highly structured as haiku, but much longer, is the sonnet. There are many different kinds. Traditionally, this is formal lyric poetry, which usually has 14 lines in a fixed pattern of rhyme and rhythm. This sonnet was written by Elizabeth Barrett Browning to her poet husband, Robert Browning. Although her sonnet comes from the slower moving world of the middle 1800s, the deep feeling of love it conveys spans time and speaks to lovers today. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight. Although in this type of sonnet there is usually a shift of mood or thought after the first eight lines, here the poet has varied the strict pattern to reinforce the range and intensity of her love. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Although the length and meter of sonnets are rigidly confined by tradition, the rhyme scheme has several variations. Here is one of them. But poetry doesn't need meter or rhyme to be poetry. Many poets, such as E. E. Cummings, have abandoned them for free verse and have relied on their own typography and punctuation to create a rhythmic pattern. Here is a section of Cummings' poem, In Just. It's spring, and the goat-footed balloon man whistles far and wee. The form and structure of poetry can vary. From E.E. E. Cummings' free verse, to haiku, to sonnet, limerick, or the stanza, block form. But regardless of poetry's structure, its language and its imagery reflect a vast spectrum of life. 
for your amusement, for your excitement, and for your appreciation. Thanks for uh, exhibiting restraint with all of your, uh, when they started talking about limericks, <laughs> there was some hint at some dirty limericks, but uh, thank you for holding back. Okay, uh, so behind me I have, um, well, let's see, hold on, right here, I have a scanner set up. And uh, we're going to watch a film that I don't know anything about it, except that I think it's, it's a, uh, from a feature film. It's missing the title. I don't know anything about it. So maybe somebody will recognize somebody in there and they can help. They can be Googling while we watch it. And we can find out what this film is, what this little segment is. I mean, that's the thing is uh, sometimes we find stuff on a reel. And this one, it basically says... It says uh, B Film Hollywood Studio. So I don't know. No idea. So um, enjoy. Maybe we'll figure out something. Oops. Well, that got copied over there for some reason. All right. All right. Enjoy. I'm smart enough to have more than one angle on a job like this. The other angles were all settled. There'll be no slip up. I'll take care of my end. Just see that you do the same. Goodbye. Hello. Three queens and two sevens, just in case. Okay, I'll tell them. It was for you, Phil. Avery's waiting for you. Very convenient. He calls you at the right time. Hey, do you let him in on all your loot? Can I help it if you pigeons don't know how to play? One more word and I won't take the money. What? That wasn't the word. Here, you monsters. Live. How'd you do today? You mean with those gorgeous, long-legged models who were parading in front of my camera all morning? Well, to tell you the truth, boss, I was trying so hard to get some good photography for you, I hardly noticed them. Yeah, I'll bet. I hope you noticed to put film in the camera. Film? What's that? You know somebody named Beck? What's your first name? It's a man. Uh, called here a few minutes ago for Never you. heard of him. Oh, I could never tell for sure. I meet so many people in my profession. Anything more for me right now? Unfortunately, no. Why don't you lie down and rest somewhere? You've had a hard day. You've got a big heart. That's an excellent suggestion. <coughs> Have some candy, Mr. Clark? Phil, dear, Phil. I'm going down for coffee. I'll be back. Uh, Mr. Spar. Yeah? My name is Beck. I saw you photographing some girls on Madison Square today, didn't I? I was there. Uh, can we talk privately? Come into my private office. You see, I think you took my picture today. Yeah? I hope it turns out all right. Uh, no, you don't understand. I was with a young lady. Hmm. Congratulations. No, but the young lady is, uh, let me put it this way, yeah. My wife might not understand. Uh oh. And if she sees me on the screen at the newsreel with that young lady, 
Well, briefly, I'm willing to pay you for that film, Mr. Spar. I'm afraid I won't be able to help you right now. That stuff's not developed yet. But when it is... I'll get in touch with you. Where will you be? I can meet you right here. Okay, it's a date. Uh, when, Mr. Spar? What time? Sometime after the film gets back and we can take a look at it. Come on, please. Make it three hours. said if I waited here... Oh, I'd... sure. Huh. Hey, Bessie, is my stuff back from the lab yet? Yes, it is. Marty's put it together. Hey, from the boss. You wait downstairs for me, and I'll have it for you in about 15 minutes. Oh, gee, thanks, Mr. Spar. Now, if you knew my wife like no, I do... No, thanks. You... I've got enough troubles already. See you in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, I'll be waiting. Shut that door! Okay, on that reel, throw it up the fashion shots. Hey, Harry, do me a favor, will you? No, oh, you owe me 25 bucks already. Listen, if I paid you the 25 bucks, you wouldn't have anything more to complain about. I find something. No kidding, Harry. That Beck character is worried because I took his picture with some dame. Says if his wife ever sees it in the newsreel, she'll beat his brains out. Well, he shouldn't be going out without his wife. Look who's talking. Come on, give the little guy a break. Now, well, let's run the film and see what he's got to worry about. Okay, Bill. To think you take money for doing this. With those new long skirts, I should get more money. What's she doing in the fashion parade? A little something I did in my spare time. Any more Cute, isn't she? I suppose you told her she'd be on the screen tomorrow. I didn't make it definite, Harry. I don't see anything much there. shot much more than that. I threw some of that stuff out in trimming. Threw it out? That's sacrilege. Take a look in the cutting room. It's all in the outtake bin. If I find it, can I get the little guy's picture? Sure, I'll let him have it. Only tell him in the future to confine himself to dark alleys or stay away from strange dames. I'll convey your kind message of sympathy to Mr. Beck. By everyone who works for August Newsreel is the best in the business. Why, take me, for instance. That's Phil Spar now, the best newsreel cameraman in the world. And why shouldn't he be? After all, I taught him everything he knows. Well, I didn't exactly teach him everything. I, I taught him how to handle the camera. Well, I didn't teach him how to handle the camera. I mean, I carried the camera. I taught him how to put the film in the camera. Uh, no, no, do I put the film in the He put the... Well, I taught... Well, she was a little too tall for me anyway. Browsing or looking for something special? As a matter of fact, I am someone special. Named Phil Spar. Well, he's a hard guy to get to, but I think I can help you. I'm his best friend. Really? Well, I'm from Snap Magazine. My name is Peggy Lane. Peggy Lane. You're a lucky girl, Peggy. Why? Because I happen to be Phil Spar. Yes, I know. 
Your assistant pointed you out. You're one of the people I'm supposed to talk to. You see, we're doing an article on men who cover the news. And uh -huh. I'm gathering local color. Are you busy, or do you have time for a chat? Well, I'm really very busy, but you've talked me into it. I'm sure you know a great deal I'd be interested in hearing. I don't want to interrupt your work. Oh, don't worry about that. Now, what you'll be interested in hearing, and I, I think you I don't know very kind of... much about newsreels, Mr. Spar, but I know you can help me. Phil, please. Well, did you find it? Harry, this is Peggy Lane. She's doing a story about important people uh -huh. like us. Peggy, Mr. Avery. He invented the newsreel. Hello. How do you do, Mr. Avery? Hello, Lane. Will you excuse us just a minute? We're doing our good deed for the year. Am I in the way? Not at all. Stay right where you are, dear. You add a little class to the joint. One gauge, and they cost three ninety-five. Mm. If that's what you were wondering about. Yeah, fifty-one gauge. Um, hmm? Wait a minute. Was he a skinny little runt with a big dame that outweighed him? Well, that's the guy. Hey, that's very nice. Always glad to be complimented on my work. I meant the dame. I was afraid of that. Guys, we should play this game more often. Uh, so close up, I'm looking it up in the uh, film super list uh, for 1940, 1949 motion pictures in the US public domain. <clears throat> and um, close up Mar uh, Marathon Pictures Corporation which was kind of I think they called those the Poverty Row there was a bunch of these uh, like, I think it was Monolith there was a couple of them um, that made what they call B Pictures uh, and in fact that's what it says on here it says B Film so it's B Picture uh so it would be shown in conjunction with maybe a higher quality film with some known names. Uh, 72 Minutes, 1948. Summary, a crime film depicting the efforts of a newsreel cameraman to keep the film from falling into the hands of Nazi war criminal who regards it as evidence against him. Authentic New York setting. Uh, and it was not renewed. Copyright was not renewed, so take that, YouTube. Um, fascinating, though. Uh, really, dig. Yeah, and we'll. Uh, I love all the eyeballs doing the Google searches, all the fingers going, listening for clues. Uh, I kept looking up Argus uh, because that kept showing up. Argus was on the job. Um, but that didn't really bring up anything. But uh, some character names, I think, did. So thank you. All right. Uh, let's learn about English on the job. We listened yesterday about uh, listening and talking. Uh, today is writing skills. Enjoy. writing in any job than you probably realize. The writing skills you're learning now at school can help you with your future occupation. 
Almost everyone uses on-the-job writing skills. Some people, like machinist Dave Mellon, use writing skills to get their jobs. All right, what do writing skills have to do with getting a job? Well, how would you apply for this one? Many ads ask you to write a letter of application. Since this is going to be your first contact with a potential employer, you want to make a good first impression, right? How can you write a letter that reads well? I noticed your ad in the newspaper. I would like to apply for your position of machine adjuster. That sounds pretty good. And it reads well. You've included the exact title of the job. That's important because the company might have advertised several openings. There's also no waste of words. It's clear. Being clear in your writing is important. But is it really enough? Being complete is important, too. I'm 18 years old and have attended McKinley High School where I have had experience with many kinds of machines in shop classes. I graduated in June. To be complete, you need to include all the information the prospective employer might be interested in. The machines include the drill press and the turret lathe. And along with being clear and complete, you try to be correct, both in what you write, the content, and how you write it, the form. Proofreading can help you make certain that your writing is accurate. With any writing, proofreading is a good idea. While checking the mechanics of your writing, you know, the capitalization, spelling, and punctuation, you can also check the correctness of your information. If your first draft looks sloppy, why not copy it over? You want the job, and if your letter can make a good impression, you just might get it. Being clear, complete, and correct are skills that can help you do any kind of writing. Carol Gill found that out when she wrote her resume. A resume is just a listing of all the important facts about you. It gives more details about yourself than a letter of application. It's like an outline with headings and subheadings. For a resume to pay off with a job, it has to communicate. And it will if it's clear, complete, and correct. Writing a resume and a letter of application are just two ways of applying for a job. Another way is just going to a business where you know there's a job opening. Even so, one of the first things you'll probably be asked to do is write. You'll need to fill out an application form. Filling out the form correctly is easy if you skim it before writing. Try not to omit any important facts. You can help yourself by writing ahead of time the information the company is likely to want. Things like your work experience, references, and a health history. Once you start writing, do it clearly. Print if you're asked to. You may not get the job if your writing can't be read. And these forms don't give you much room for writing long, involved explanations and answers. If you take the time to think, try to understand why the questions are being asked, you can be direct and to the point in your writing. Taking a minute to think before you write always makes it easier for you to be clear and complete. Understanding the questions helps you be brief and correct in your explanations. These writing skills you use getting a job also can be applied to writing on the job. Your first job might be like Cal Williams. He drives and delivers for an uptown bakery. 
Like Cal, you might find that a small part of the job requires writing, just routine writing, invoices and things. But maybe someday you might be faced with something new, like an accident report. A lot of the on-the-job writing deals with forms like this one. With any new form, skimming it first helps you make sense out of it. Accident report forms are usually designed so that the questions are presented in an orderly way. This accident form has an outline structure with each question similar to an outline heading. The outline structure helps you lay out a clear report. You may have to write some reports for which there are no forms. That's the way it is for George Fletcher. No one gives him an outline for his monthly sales reports. Sales reports are a common type of on-the-job writing in which outlining can help you. Every month, George writes his sales report to his boss in St. Louis. George has been selling encyclopedias since he's been out of the Army. He enjoys being out of doors and meeting people. At first, George didn't like the idea of making reports. He felt he was hired to sell, not to write. But he discovered that outlining his report first helped him lay out the information in a logical and understandable order. Each main topic corresponds to a section of the report. The subtopics help form the sentences and paragraphs of the report. So, with on-the-job writing of reports or forms, if you're clear, complete, and correct, you can do the job much better. Another kind of common on-the-job writing is the business letter. These letters, particularly, should be written with care to prevent costly errors. To help your letters do their job, try to get to the point as quickly as possible. Thank you for your letter of February 27. I will personally see that the part you requested is shipped as soon as possible. Each paragraph in your letter should express a single idea. When you present a new idea, start a new paragraph. As you probably no. The fire at the supply plant has caused a four-week delay in the shipment of parts throughout the Midwest. However, you can expect shipment of the distributor head, part DX50089, as soon as a part becomes available to us. What makes this a good letter is that it says just what it has to and stops. It's brief, but it's clear and complete. And it's correct because it contains the right information and it follows the form and standards set by company policy. The business letter is just one type of correspondence people have to do on jobs. Another type is the inter-office memo. Carol is starting her vacation next week. She's writing a memo for her temporary replacement. It's about the company's procedure for letters. Once again, the aim should be to be clear, complete, and correct. With all our routine letters, we make two carbons. When you're done with the letter, give it to Mr. Williams for approval and signature. After approval, Put the letter into the envelope. 
Then put the envelope into the top tray on the desk. It'll be picked up by a messenger. This is a pretty clear memo, but is it complete? What happens to the carbon copies of the letter? One carbon goes into the correspondence file behind the desk you will be using. The other carbon goes to Mrs. Alton. Good writers try to anticipate readers' questions. Like, who is Mrs. Alton? Where is she? She's Mr. Lewis's secretary and works in room 405 on this floor. Good writers include all the essential information in their writing. With all on-the-job correspondence, memos or letters, writing that's clear, complete and correct adds up to good total communication. So you can see, there's probably a lot more writing related to work, more than you may have realized. And by now, you also know that good on-the-job communication is clear, complete, and correct. Good writing skills can pay off for you. They can help open the way to more responsibility and better paying jobs. I really like that. The uh, um, this reminds me. I did a show in uh, Toronto, or I did a screening at a class that was a class about kind of technology and um, communication. And uh, I showed them a film called Writing Better Business Letters, and uh, it's a cornet film, of course. And it uh, basically had these two guys who were looking to write a business letter and what they were trying to do is write a record store that was in their hometown uh, to see if they could get uh, two records uh, that they could purchase and then have mailed to them in time for a party that they were having uh, the following week. So I showed this to uh, people who are currently college students and it blew their mind. <laughs> Like, the whole idea of, one, buying music is, is kind of weird, because a lot of people are just streaming music. Two, uh, buying music, uh, a physical thing of music, uh, was also strange. The fact that they had to pull out this device called a typewriter and actually type it. Uh, the other thing that was really great was carbons. Uh, and I kind of asked the class, I said... Uh, do you know what CC stands for? And s someone said, well, it's carbon copy. And I'm like, that's what it's from. And everybody's like, oh. It was like all these light bulbs like blew up like, oh. And then we looked at the business letter as a way of like, look, look at the structure of your email. When you do an email, here's the subject line, here's who it's going to, here's the, the carbon copy, so you see who it's CC'd to. The whole thing, it's a business letter. And then some people have a salutation or they have a like a, a thing at the bottom. Everybody's brain just exploded. Um, there, that film was so much, <laughs> so much stuff that they just didn't know how to handle it. And uh, my friend, the, my friend, the professor who hosted me, uh, she did kind of a follow-up quiz. And some of them, they they were just lost, and there was so much information in this weird film from the the fifties. Uh, so. This is why I collect and I show films, uh, to blow college students' minds. All right, here is a film about vegetables from garden to table. Enjoy. Mm, yeah. 
<laughs> Move along. Attention, all members of Company B area details. Good. Warden Sergeant Watson, 1600 hours of rooms and shovels to police the company area. Good. Attention, all members of Company B area details. Hey, Sarge. Buy some cauliflower Florentine and artichoke cart crepes. <laughs> Sarge, not <clears throat> mashed potatoes and peas yep. again. It looks like you boiled them to death. Well, what did you think you enlisted in anyway? A chef school? <laughs> oh. Can't you serve vegetables any other way? Eat it, you'll like it. What the sergeant didn't know was that the abundant variety of vegetables and serving methods can make them the highlight of daily meals. And if properly prepared, Vegetables can make substantial contributions to the vitamins and minerals that we need for good health. For example, an orange at breakfast is not the only way to get your daily quota of vitamin C. This combination of vegetables eaten during the day will provide the same amount of vitamin C as an orange. The nutrients in vegetables are largely influenced by the part of the plant from which the vegetable comes. And all parts of the plant produce vegetables, roots, stems, leaves, fruit, and flowers. Although most vegetables can be cooked, many are enjoyed in their raw form, both as snacks and salad ingredients. We'll start with the vegetables that grow below the ground, roots and tubers. These are all examples. Radishes and carrots make colorful raw garnishes. Trim root vegetables sparingly at the root and leaf ends. To make radish roses, make four slashes, which when chilled in ice water, spread into a petal design. Cut carrots in sticks, rings, or curls. Curls are long, thin strips, rolled, and held with a toothpick. They retain their shape after chilling in ice water. Turnips and rutabagas are often waxed to hold in moisture for shipping. This is removed when they are paired. Although usually eaten cooked, try them paired and cut into raw wedges or shredded for salads. The stems are the next part in the progression of the plant. Celery and asparagus represent the edible stems of plants. Cut off the core end of celery to separate the stems. Wash thoroughly, but don't scrape. Use all parts of celery. Trim only the very tip ends and the bruised portions. Add the coarse outer stems to cook dishes for texture and flavor. Use the inner ones for relishes. Leaves are good for toss salad or soup. There's an abundance of edible vegetable leaves from which to choose. The leaves are low in calories because they are low in starch they are high in moisture content and contribute much cellulose or fiber to the diet and aid to the digestive system. Buy fresh, crisp-looking salad vegetables, then refrigerate them as soon as possible. Large amounts of vitamin C are lost from vegetables just by leaving them at room temperature. Since the darker green leaves have more vitamins, discard them only if badly bruised or shred them to use in soups. Plunge the leaf greens in water and lift out so grit will filter to the bottom. Drain well. Refrigerate in sealed plastic containers. Head lettuce stores best uncored, but to crisp inner leaves, remove the core by wrapping the head against the counter and twist or cut the core out. Rinse, drain, and store cut end down. Take the rib out of coarse leaves as well as any dark spots. Since cut surfaces allow greater quantities of vitamin C to be lost, tear or shred just before serving. Some flowers and flower clusters of plants produce edible vegetables. Choose pure white heads of cauliflower, broccoli free of yellow tinges, and artichokes with tightly clinging green leaf scales. Rinse the head of cauliflower and remove the outer leaves. To make appealing finger food, break or cut off the flowerets from the central core. 
For salads, slice thinly just before use. The blossom of many plants develops into a fruit. Technically, these vegetables are fruits because they contain seeds and the food needed for seeds to develop. The seeds which remain soft are edible as part of the total vegetable. For example, those in eggplant, summer squash, cucumbers, and tomatoes. When cucumbers are served raw, it adds a pretty touch to pull a fork through the green skin in parallel rows before slicing. Cut open green peppers and remove seeds and section membranes. Then, slice into strips or rings to serve. Use toothpicks to insert these raw vegetables into a round vegetable for an enticing centerpiece. And provide some nutritious dips made from beans or broccoli. Or simply combine them for a tossed salad. Well, that's an appetizing variety of raw vegetables. However, there are also good reasons for eating cooked vegetables. First of all, some vegetables can't be eaten raw. Also, cooking softens fiber and aids in the digestion and absorption of food. The principal goals in cooking vegetables are to protect color, flavor, and texture, and to preserve nutrients. Now, there are moist and dry heat methods of cookery. Oven baking and broiling are dry heat methods. Since nutrients in vegetables are concentrated near the skin, Baking them unpeeled is an excellent cooking method for retaining these nutrients. Just scrub and remove the eyes. Oiling the potato produces a softer, more edible skin. Prick the skin so they don't explode from accumulated steam. Cook until they feel uniformly soft when pinched with a pot holder. The length of cooking time is determined more by the size of the vegetable than by the number baked. Vegetables such as winter varieties of squash and pumpkin should be washed and cut in half. Remove the seeds and place cut side down on a baking sheet. Or add stuffing and place right side up. Bake at 375 to 425 degrees until fork tender. Serve in the skin or scrape the softened pulp out and serve mashed. The deep yellow or orange color of these vegetables is provided by carotene, a plant pigment. It indicates an excellent supply of vitamin A. The deeper the yellow-orange color of the vegetable, the more vitamin A it contains. Use broiling for vegetables with a high moisture content. To make kebabs, place a variety of vegetables on a skewer. These have been dipped in vegetable oil to prevent the surfaces from drying. Rest them on the cold broiler pan three inches from the heat. Cook until just tender crisp. When overdone, they get mushy and fall off the skewer. Moist heat cookery, including boiling and steaming, is used for starchy vegetables to swell the starch granules, making them more soluble. In other vegetables, it softens the cellulose. Using this method, green vegetables pose the biggest challenge to retaining nutrients, good color, flavor, and texture. Like yellow vegetables, they're good sources of vitamin A, but the carotene is masked by chlorophyll, a green pigment. The green color indicates they are high in vitamin C, in fact, the darker green the vegetable, the more vitamin C it has. However, vitamin C is difficult to retain during cooking because it dissolves in liquid and can be destroyed by enzymes in a warm environment. But, since enzymes are inactivated at the boiling point, it is logical to start the cooking process in boiling water and to use as little water as possible. We'll use broccoli in a demonstration of moist heat cooking. After washing and removing the leaves, divide the thick stalks vertically or into small pieces. That way they'll cook as fast as the flower tops. 
Add the broccoli to the boiling water. Cover and return to the boiling point on high heat. Then reduce heat to maintain a slow boil. Using just enough water to prevent scorching is called waterless cooking. This method relies upon the steam created to do the cooking. If cooked quickly in a pan with a tight-fitting lid to a tender but crisp doneness, a bright green is maintained. When cooked well done, the cell walls break down and allow the chlorophyll to react with natural plant acids. This creates an olive drab color and a strong flavor. Leaving the lid off but using more cooking water is often recommended for vegetables in the cabbage family. This is because they contain sulfur compounds which break down during cooking, creating a strong aroma and flavor. With the lid off, these compounds can escape. However, since half of the vitamin C will end up in the cooking liquid, it should be eaten with the vegetables. This is especially true for canned vegetables. One solution is to remove the vegetables, boil the liquid down to only a few tablespoons, then return vegetables to the liquid until just hot throughout. Fresh vegetables may also be steamed in a perforated container placed over boiling water so that the vegetables are not touching the water. As for this artichoke, prepare an artichoke by cutting off most of the stem and clipping the tips of the leaves, including half an inch on top. Cover with a tight-fitting lid. When done, leaves should pull off easily. They can be served hot or cold. This looks good. I've never tried one. Obviously. Look, you just pull off one of the leaves and dip it in the sauce of your choice. Well, that sure looks like more fun. Mmm, that is good. Sweet corn, peas, and green beans can be eaten as immature seeds. However, in their fully ripened state, these seeds turn dry and need to be cooked in liquid before eating. Dried vegetable seeds provide B vitamins, calcium, and iron, and are a good source of protein when combined with animal protein. Sort out damaged beans or foreign matter and rinse. The beans absorb the liquid, so use two to three times as much water as beans. One cup of beans will make two cups when cooked. Cover with water and let soak overnight. When ready to cook, bring the beans to a boil in the soaking water in order to retain vitamins dissolved in the water. For flavor, add onion, garlic, celery, carrots, herbs, bacon, or bony meat. Reduce the heat and simmer slowly until fully tender. Fast high heat breaks the skin, which causes them to become mushy. Check doneness with a fork. Microwave ovens may be used to cook vegetables with or without moisture while saving time and energy. However, their main advantage in vegetable cookery is retaining nutrients. Frozen vegetables, for instance, may be cooked without adding any extra water. No loss of nutrients to cooking liquid. Since it's not necessary to use boiling water to cook fresh corn on the cob or frozen vegetables in the pouch, they are microwave favorites. Slash the pouch to avoid pressure buildup. Because the husk forms a natural insulation, the corn is steamed in its own moisture. Just micro cook a couple of minutes per ear. When cooked, silks peel back with the husk. Stir frying is a technique adapted from Chinese cookery. Vegetables prepared in this manner retain nutrients and color because of the short cooking time. Use vegetables high in moisture. Leafy greens, such as cabbage, are shredded. 
Cut asparagus, carrots, and celery in very thin diagonal strips. These shapes add to visual appeal. They also have maximum exposed surface area, so they will cook quickly. A funnel-shaped pan called a wok is the traditional utensil for this technique, but a heavy skillet may also be used. Add the chopped vegetables to two tablespoons of hot oil and stir to quickly coat them in the oil. The food should pop and sizzle. Keep it moving so it won't stick. Add extra moisture, cover, and steam just a few minutes to reach a translucent, tender crispness. Eggplant adapts well to pan frying. Pair only if the skin is tough. Slice half an inch thick and dip into beaten egg, then seasoned flour or breadcrumbs. Fry uncovered in a small amount of oil over moderate heat, two to four minutes or until lightly browned and tender crisp. We're all aware of the technique of French frying potatoes, but the Japanese deep fat fry all kinds of vegetables dipped in a batter. The result is called tempura. Wash and dry the vegetables so the batter will adhere to them. Non-starchy kinds are best, but the secret is to cut them thin. And cut them in interesting shapes. Short carrot sticks, diagonal slices of celery and zucchini, wedges of turnip, bite-sized cauliflower blossoms. The batter and oil are critical factors. Use a mild vegetable oil heated to 350 degrees. Cut the vegetables and begin heating the oil before making the batter, which should be ice cold when used. Test the oil with a little drop of batter. It should sink to the bottom, then quickly rise in the midst of bubbles. Dip the vegetables into the batter one at a time, then into the oil. Repeat, but don't overload the hot fat. Fry about one minute or until light brown. The batter creates a seal around the vegetables so that they are tenderized by their natural moisture turning to steam. That's why small pieces work best. You'll be surprised at the new mellow flavors you detect. This is a good way to try new vegetables. Drain, then serve hot with a choice of dipping sauces, horseradish, sweet sour, or mustard. It's easy to see that there's a wide variety of vegetables offering a good balance of nutrients. And both raw and cooked vegetables can be incorporated into any part of a meal, from appetizers to dessert. Use them to add color and excitement to your meals. Would have been better with bongos, I think. Um... Yeah, so there's there's a series of these uh, Centron films about home cookery uh, that show how to... There's one called Meat Cookery. There's one about baking. Um, so, there you go. Very... Uh, the beginning had a little interesting narrative, but it very quickly got down to brass tacks of just, here we go. We're gonna show you how to prepare vegetables. And so this was for home economics, um, mostly. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, this is a special show, because this is episode 999, nine, uh, episode that we've been doing. Uh, what is an actor's name of the, of the guy that was in that film? He looked really familiar, but man, I think a bunch of people in the early 80s looked like that guy. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yes, thank you for tuning in. Tomorrow it's going to be really, it is really, truly the thousandth episode, but we're not going to celebrate until Saturday. So Saturday we're going to, um, 
we're gonna have a thousand minute show and we're gonna go from 9 a.m to two ish something like that um so join us we will certainly mark the fact that there is a uh, thousandth show tomorrow and some of you already guess what's going to happen um and I'm, so yeah i'm going to do that you know with, i'm not going to disappoint people uh but uh tune in tomorrow and we'll celebrate and then we will on saturday do the big shindig um everybody have a great rest of your day and we will see you soon um enjoy the rest of the day i think it's a habit for me to say enjoy at the end to punctuate whatever i'm saying with enjoy uh that's if you do something 999 times uh and you do it over and over again that's uh now it's a habit so we will see you tomorrow take care